Welcome to the Newton tutorial series. I'm Mike Cruz with AC Tech and in this tutorial I'm going to continue my discussion of the geometry input page. In the last video we talked about basic importing of your geometry and in this tutorial we're going to talk about controlling the velocity of the triangles on those layers. So Let's go ahead and import the same shoot that we were working with in the last video. We can see that this shoot has a head shoot, a discharge, a skirt, and a couple of um, chunks of belt. Now, we probably want to give that receiving belt a velocity. And the first thing to talk about is how does Newton handle triangle velocity? Because in reality, on a real conveyor belt, obviously the belt itself is moving. The, the belt physically moves, and that's where the velocity comes from. But in Newton, we don't want to physically move these triangles if we don't have to. That's just more complicated. So what we do instead is we give the triangles a surface velocity, which means we basically just tell Newton that the triangles are moving. We tell Newton that those triangles have a velocity, but we don't actually move the triangles. And then if a particle were to come into contact with the belt, it would act as though it was touching a moving surface and it moves along with the belt. So if I switch to wireframe mode, I can see that my belt appears to be horizontal. Sure, from a front view we can see there's no incline on that belt. And if I go to a top view, okay, the belt is actually straight in the X direction as well. Okay, so if I want to give this, this chunk of the belt a, a velocity, we'll switch to that receiving belt layer, and I'll go ahead and punch in a velocity in the negative x direction. So I'd give it a velocity of negative 3 in the x. Now if I turn on my show velocity vectors, I can zoom in and see that there's actually a velocity vector. Newton renders a small vector at the center of each triangle and shows the direction of the velocity and we can see that that's correct. So that works pretty well if our belt happens to be have no inclination and it has no rotation about the vertical axis. But what if we happen to be working with a belt like this? Now this belt has been inclined. It's no longer pointing in the X direction. And you could say, well, Certainly, if I know that the incline of that belt is 10 degrees, then I know that the, the x component of my velocity is just going to be 3, negative 3 rather, times the cosine of 10 degrees, and the z component is going to be positive 3 times the sine of 10 degrees. And sure, if you want to break out your calculator and do that, it's not too difficult. But what if we were working with the belt that looked a little more like this? So that this belt has an incline, but it also has a rotation. So it's no longer aligned in with any of these three axes. It's going to have its velocity is going to have an x, y, and a z component. Now that calculation is a little bit more complicated than just a simple sine cosine. So if you want, you could still break out your calculator and, and, and write out the calculation and do that. But rather than doing that, you could use our feature down here, our set velocity fee, uh, set velocity vector. So what you would do is you'd go to that receiving belt layer and you would say I want my velocity to be 3 meters per second and click the button. And what this did is it assigned a velocity vector to that belt. And if we verify that we can see that uh oh the velocity vector is pointing in the wrong direction. It looks like it got all the angles correct but it's just going in the opposite direction. And if that happens all you do is switch this positive to a negative and click the button and it will fix itself. It'll just switch the sign of each of these components. Because the way that Newton calculates this velocity vector is it looks at the layer and says, well, generally when people want to assign velocities to a layer, they're doing it with a receiving belt or a feed belt. And generally when they draw that belt, they use a series of long skinny triangles like this. So what it does is it looks for those long skinny triangles and aligns the axis of the vector with those triangles. The only thing it doesn't know is, well, I can align it with the triangle, but which direction is positive and which direction is negative. And sometimes it gets it wrong. And if it does, all you do is switch that magnitude right there. So let's go ahead and do the same thing with the extension. Give it that same velocity, and we see that, oh, now this one is backwards. This section of triangles wanted to have a positive 3 right there. So all you do is switch that, and you're good to go.
So this also brings up another point. Sometimes when you're looking at belt wear, you're going to take your, your belt and you're going to mesh it up into some pretty small triangles. So you use this equalize triangles button to mesh up that belt a little bit finer. And we'll talk about meshing up the belt in, in another tutorial. But if we were to do that, we see that each of those new triangles has a velocity vector. But what if before assigning this velocity vector, we meshed up the belt? Now what happens when we try and use this velocity vector uh, button? Well, Newton gets confused and says, well, now the longest triangle is going across the belt, not along the belt. So now it's, it's completely messed up, that, um, that belt velocity vector. So this means that if you want to mesh up your belt, just make sure that you do it after you set those velocity vectors. And not before. So let's go ahead and re-import that geometry. And now we can go ahead, switch back to that layer, and set that vector and it's correct again. And now I could go to each of these layers and I could equalize those triangles and then I could divide them a few times and make them much smaller. And again, we'll talk about that in a different tutorial. So along with setting the velocity, I can also tell Newton, well, how do I want to handle these velocities? If you just set a velocity, then Newton will assume that that surface will have that same velocity for the entire simulation. But what if I wanted to start it at some later point in the simulation? If I enter a start time of, say, five seconds, the belt will not have a velocity at the start of the simulation. And at five seconds, the belt velocity will turn on and instantly become three meters per second with this vector. Now, of course, that's not necessarily realistic. Your belt doesn't start in an instant. Generally, these conveyors start in, say, five to 30 seconds, depending on your conveyor. So we can also give, a vol give an acceleration and say, well, I want to start um, at five seconds, and I want to accelerate over 10 seconds. So now the belt will start at five, and by 15, by time t equals 15 seconds, that belt will be running at full speed now. It will have a 10 second acceleration period. So that's great, but what if I want to stop my belt? Well, we have a stop time here as well. So let's say I want to stop my belt at 20 seconds. So the belt starts at 5, and by 15 seconds it has become fully accelerated. So 5 seconds later, at time t equals 20, we want to stop that belt. Well, just like with the start time, if you put a stop time but no deceleration, the belt will instantly stop. But no, belts usually coast to a stop, or, or they come to a stop with a braking system, but it's not instantaneous, of course. So we can enter our deceleration time. Say we want to decelerate the belt over 15 seconds. So now the belt will stop at 20 seconds, and it will decelerate over a period of 15 seconds. So the belt will come to a complete stop at 35 seconds. And now finally, if I want, I could even restart that belt. So after starting and accelerating the belt, stopping and decelerating the belt, I could restart it at, say, 45 seconds. And I could even give it a restart acceleration of another, you know, the same 10 seconds. So that, this allows us to start and accelerate the belt, then stop and decelerate the belt, and then restart the belt and re-accelerate it again. And I want to take the time to note that while you can do this with all of the layers that you import, you can also do this on these custom belts that we allow you to generate. So we'll talk about these um, we'll talk about these belts in a separate tutorial. But the point is that down at the bottom under belt speed, we have the same start time, acceleration, stop, and deceleration, and restart and restart acceleration. It's the exact same function as these inputs right here, and you can apply that to your belt. So let's go ahead and see an example of this. I'll bring up a, an animation here. So what's happening here is the chute is uh, the, the transfer system is coming to steady state. Both of our belts are moving at full speed. And at time t equals 10 seconds, this belt comes to an emergency stop over one second. This belt stops at the same time, but it stops over 15 seconds, so it's filling up the chute with material. So by time 25 seconds, this comes to a complete stop. 
and at 30 seconds we're going to restart this belt and accelerate it over six seconds while it pulls out that material. And five seconds uh, after after this one starts, this one is also going to restart. And now at time 45 seconds it's reached full speed and we're back to our same steady state condition. So I'll play that one more time. So we shut this one down at 10 seconds. At the same time we shut this one down. This has a deceleration of 1 second. This has a deceleration of 15 seconds. At 25 seconds this is completely stopped. At 30 seconds we restart this over a 6 second acceleration. At 35 we restart this over a 10 second acceleration. So at time 45 seconds, we're back to our steady state flow condition. Now I had noticed something in this video that was curious. If I go back to our pullout, let's watch our pullout, and right there, you'll notice that the material coming discharging from our feed belt is actually going right onto the receiving belt without landing in either rock box here or in this little um, spoon. So that material is moving at a pretty velo pretty high velocity. It's probably, you know, higher than 10 or 12 meters per second and it's impacting right on that receiving belt. So what if this flow included a uh, very sharp or very abrasive material or or maybe it's large chunks of iron ore, large boulders. We don't want that material to impact directly on our receiving belt. That just looks like a horrible design. Certainly once we get back up to steady state, we're using both of these rock boxes just like we want it to. But for that uh, period before that, it looks like a better design might be to either change the shape or location of this ledge here or possibly to move this whole spoon forward so that we're always going to be capturing that flow. Certainly just, uh, sh just, just shows one example of how you can use your belt deceleration and acceleration to, to look at your transient flow conditions and identify problem areas with your chute design before you even send that design to, to the, the fabrication plant. So if we go ahead and open up that input file, we can see where those velocities were set. And this opens in a sec. Here we go. So obviously, these two belts are both auto-generated in Newton, so we didn't input any of, the, any of the coordinates right here. Instead, we did it over in the belt section. But if I look at my feed belt, well, let's look at the receiving belt first. If I look at this receiving belt, we had stopped that belt at 10 seconds and decelerated over one second. That belt was restarted at 30 seconds over a period of six seconds. Now if I look at my feed belt, the feed belt was also stopped at 10 seconds, but we didn't decelerate it for another 15 seconds. Or rather, our deceleration time was 15 seconds. And then we restarted this five seconds after we restarted the second belt. So this restarted at 35 seconds over a 10 second acceleration period. So at 45 seconds, this was back at steady state, and the entire system was at steady state perhaps just a few seconds later. So that pretty much covers uh, our discussion of velocity control. And in the next tutorial, we're going to talk about the layer movement and layer deactivation. So if you have any questions about the velocity control, you can consult the manual. Or if you feel it necessary, you can go ahead and send uh, an email to info at ACTech.com. Thanks.